Hey there. So the podcast is currently on an extended hiatus so that I can write my next book and work on some other exciting projects. But while we're away, I hope you'll enjoy this fan favorite episode from the archives. If you want brand new content to help you make peace with food and heal from diet culture, come sign up for my free weekly newsletter at christyharrison.com slash newsletter, where I answer a weekly listener question. And as always, if you join my Intuitive Eating Fundamentals course at christyharrison.com slash course, you get access to our exclusive monthly Q&A podcast where I answer all your new questions. Just go to christyharrison.com slash newsletter and christyharrison.com slash course to sign up or click the links in the episode description. Welcome to Food Psych, a podcast about intuitive eating, health at every size, body liberation, and taking down diet culture. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm an anti-diet registered dietitian, certified intuitive eating counselor, and author of the book, Anti-Diet, Reclaim Your Time, Money, Well-Being, and Happiness Through Intuitive Eating, which is available wherever books are sold. Join me here every week as I interview interesting people from all different backgrounds about their paths toward peace with food in their bodies. And by the way, on this show, we bleep out diet culture stuff like weight and calorie numbers, but we don't censor swear words or other adult language, so listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to episode 221 of Food Psych. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and today I'm talking with Becky Young, the founder of an organization in the UK called Anti-Diet Riot Club and a fellow anti-diet activist. We discuss how diet culture intersects with other forms of oppression, how to respond to people who push back against the anti-diet message, why anger is important in eating disorder recovery, how unconditional permission to eat can free your mind to focus on things other than food, and so much more. I cannot wait to share this conversation with you in just a moment. But first, I'll answer this week's listener question, which is from a listener named Rosie, who writes, Hi, Christy. I often hear it said, people in large your bodies. I'm wondering, larger than what? So thanks, Rosie, for that great question. And before I answer, just my standard disclaimer that these answers and this podcast in general are for informational and educational purposes only and aren't a substitute for individual medical or mental health advice. So I liked this question a lot. I thought this was a good question to answer now because we have a lot of new listeners joining us for the new year. So welcome if you're new to the podcast. And I think it's helpful to define terms like this when you first start out on the anti-diet path, when you first get into a podcast like this or read a book like mine. It's helpful to know what these terms mean. So first, I want to talk about the phrase people in larger bodies, and then I'm actually going to define another term that I think is going to be helpful for understanding kind of the the full import of this phrase. So first, people in larger bodies. When those of us in the anti-diet movement use this phrase, we're really using it as a value-neutral way of saying that somebody's body is larger than the so-called normal range. Ugh, I hate that term even, but the so-called normal range on the BMI my chart and that there's nothing morally or medically wrong with that right so as i explain in the introduction to my book the words quote unquote overweight and quote unquote obese i only use them in quotation marks because they have a really troubling history that is born out of oppressive beliefs about body size and these words really stigmatize people in larger bodies and treat body size like a disease which is actually likely to be more harmful to people's health than their weight itself. And in fact, weight itself is not quote unquote bad for health the way we've been told in diet culture anyway. I talk about this all in a lot of depth in my book, Anti-Diet, so definitely recommend checking that out for all that background. 
So instead of using those O words, instead of using those stigmatizing terms, I typically use the phrase people in larger bodies or higher weight people to emphasize the fact that body size is a neutral trait, the way we would say, you know, people with brown hair or taller people or whatever, right? And also to highlight the fact that we're all just temporary inhabitants of these bodies that we use to move around the world, right? We might be in smaller bodies or larger ones, but we'd all cease to be here if it weren't for our bodies, if it weren't for the fact that we are in these bodies, using them to move around. Now, many of my friends and colleagues in the anti-diet movement embrace the word fat as a neutral descriptor for their own body size. And you'll hear me use that term with them on this podcast when, you know, my guests in the podcast or my sources in the book self-identify that way. And it's in the spirit of the fat acceptance movement and fat liberation that we use that term. Now, I don't generally use the term fat as a descriptor outside of that context, outside of talking with people who identify that way, only because I recognize that it can really stir up a lot of traumatic memories to hear a smaller bodied person like me labeling you with a word that might have been hurled your way as an epithet in the past, right? So if that's been an experience that you've had and then you hear this smaller bodied dietitian throwing around the word fat, I think it can be You know, and I've heard from people who say that it is kind of jarring for them to hear that. And so that's why I don't use that term other than using it with people who self-identify that way. And while I truly believe that the word fat should not carry any stigma and that the only reason it does is because of diet culture, I also know that not everyone is ready or willing to reclaim that term for themselves. And I don't want to alienate those people from my work. I don't want to alienate people who are not ready or willing to reclaim that term, but who still want to accept their larger bodies. Now, of course, the label larger bodied or higher weight can seem kind of subjective and hard to define, right? A writer I really admire who writes under the pseudonym Your Fat Friend defines it as people who wear plus size clothing. And that can be a helpful way to understand the line between, you know, smaller or medium bodied and larger bodied, right? But of course, some folks at the higher end of the BMI spectrum or people who wear plus sizes don't necessarily read as being larger bodied, meaning that they have what's known as thin privilege, even if they are at a certain position on the BMI spectrum or they wear plus sizes. And so now I want to define and unpack that term a bit, thin privilege, because I think it can really help illuminate what people mean when they talk about the experience of living in a larger body. So thin privilege means that by virtue of being or even just looking like you're below a certain size, you have greater access to resources and face less discrimination in society than people who are or who appear to be larger than that size. Right. And so, again, it is kind of arbitrary the where that line is. But you can think of thin privilege as similar to any other kind of privilege in that way. Right. For example, there's male privilege or white privilege or able bodied privilege or any other kind of privilege, you know, based on a group that is less oppressed in society versus a group that is more oppressed. Right. Where some arbitrary characteristic of a person's body gives them greater access to all of the things that we all want and deserve like freedom and respect and acceptance and basic human rights. So people in larger bodies, a.k.a. higher weight people, a.k.a. people who wear plus sizes, face really consistent and systemic oppression in this society. So it's not just body shaming by a few individual assholes, but an asshole culture that makes it difficult or impossible to find clothes that fit, to find spaces that fit, to find health care that's effective and non-discriminatory, to find equal access to employment, and all of the other basic human rights that we all deserve. So the term thin privilege is used to highlight this systemic disparity and to call out the fact that dignity and respect and equitable treatment should not be privileges reserved for smaller bodied folks at all, right? They should be universal rights afforded to everyone, no matter their size. And by the way, I just want to say here that having thin privilege does not mean that you've never had any body image issues or that you've never struggled with disordered eating or that you've never been bullied or shamed by individual assholes for your size. You can have thin privilege and also hate your body. And I know I was in that boat myself for many, many years. 
And having thin privilege doesn't even mean that you feel thin, right? And in fact, I'd wager that the vast majority of people in diet culture never feel thin, even those with thin privilege. As that writer, your fat friend, put it in a recent essay, quote, thinness is always distant, unattainable, a punishing standard that few feel they can meet, end quote. I know it took me a while myself to get my head around the term thin privilege because I always used to think thin was a word reserved for waif-like models, you know, not for someone like me, even though I've always lived in a relatively small body and I've always actually had thin privilege. But the reality is if you're someone who's able to go to the doctor without being told to lose weight for your health conditions, and if mainstream clothing stores carry your size pretty much across the board, and if you can fit fairly easily into airplane and theater seats and booths at restaurants, you know, I'm not talking about being uncomfortable on air air travel or in theater seats like a lot of us are because they're just not big enough for most people, right? But, you know, you can actually fit into the seats and you can fly without having to buy a second plane ticket. And if you've never had insults hurled at you about your weight while you walk down the street, then all of those things mean that you have thin privilege. Even if you don't think of yourself as thin, and even if you hate your body right now and wish it were smaller. And actually, the reason that so many of us have experienced hating our bodies and wishing they were smaller while also having thin privilege is diet culture, right? It's this fat phobic and food phobic system of beliefs that conditions all of us in Western culture to stigmatize larger bodies and to aspire to smaller ones. Diet culture is why both anti-fat stigma and thin privilege exist. And we really couldn't have thin privilege without fat phobia, right? They're two sides of the same coin, the diet culture coin. And so that brings me back to the phrase people in larger bodies. While it may not be a crystal clear term for defining a person's, you know, particular person's body size, right? In every instance, it's a little nebulous in some cases. It's meant to help speak about higher weight bodies in a non-stigmatizing way and thereby to help challenge fat phobia in everyday contexts. Because every time someone hears the phrase person in a larger body, instead of one of those horrible O words that treats larger bodies as if they were diseased, it helps open the door to a world in which all bodies, including the very largest ones on the spectrum, are treated with the respect and compassion that we all deserve. So I hope that helps answer your question, and I have lots more to say about why larger body size should not be pathologized in my book, which is called Anti-Diet and which is available now at bookstores everywhere and at christyharrison.com slash book. If you want to submit your own question for a chance to have it answered on an upcoming episode, go to christyharrison.com slash questions. That's christyharrison.com slash questions. And then if you want to ask me any question you want and have me answer it much more quickly than I can here, come check out my online course, Intuitive Eating Fundamentals. There I answer participants' questions every single month, and you also get a treasure trove of special content helping you work through the principles of intuitive eating, really getting into the nitty-gritty details of how to do it, and also access to our private community forum for daily support from my team, as well as hundreds of other awesome course members around the world. If you're ready to break free from diet culture and reclaim the life it stole from you, you can learn more and sign up for the course at christyharrison.com slash course. That's christyharrison.com slash course. This episode of Food Psych is brought to you by Thread Up. If you're ready to replace the stuff in your closet that you don't wear anymore or that you've realized is just uncomfortable, you can do it with Thread Up. They make it so easy to sell clothes and get amazing pieces for a fraction of the price of new stuff. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that one of my number one recommendations for people who are trying to break free from diet culture but feeling uncomfortable in their bodies is to buy comfortable clothes that fit the body you have now, not the body you had six months ago or the one that you think you might have later this year, but the one you have right now and be comfortable in your clothes. And ThreadUp makes it stress-free and affordable to switch out your wardrobe. The selection is amazing. They're the world's largest online thrift store with up to 90% off of estimated retail. And they have lots of great brands, including plus size and size inclusive ones. Instead of spending hours scouring through racks at the thrift store, you can customize your search on ThreadUp by your size, your style, and your budget. So you can find the best deals instantly. 
Plus, ThreadUp gets new arrivals every minute, so there are always new finds coming in. I'm going to be doing some TV appearances and speaking gigs to promote my book in the coming weeks, so I actually use ThreadUp to get some new stuff to wear, and I scored five great outfits that are new to me and really nice for less than 100 bucks. ThreadUp pieces are sustainable, stylish, and totally affordable. You'll feel even better in 2020 with gorgeous new threads from ThreadUp. And for Food Psych listeners, here's an exclusive offer. You can get an extra 30% off your first order at threadup.com slash food psych. That's T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H for 30% off your first order. Threadup.com slash food psych for an extra 30% off today. Terms apply. And now without any further ado, let's go talk to Becky Young. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. Oh, this is a question I've been thinking about answering for quite a while now. My relationship with food was definitely not one of scarcity. I was quite lucky in that respect. I never was like wanting the food in the evenings or I felt like I had quite a privileged childhood in terms of food. But I definitely think that my parents' history of growing up without a lot of food has affected me if that makes sense. So I've inherited some of the consequences of them growing up with no meals on the table and having to like fight over food with their siblings because they both came from really big families. And like so many people on this podcast and, you know, that I know, um, their insecurities around food and their bodies and their body image has obviously affected me. But when I was younger, food was such an important part of like family gatherings. My fa- my dad's family are Chinese Jamaican. So massive family dinners with loads of chicken and rice and gorgeous vegetables, but also a kind of very frantic <laughs> approach to eating it. My dad always used to joke about that he had he grew up with four brothers and that they literally fought each other over the table to eat. And I know that's I don't know whether this is something that I've picked up from my mom saying, you're just like your father, but they definitely eat very quickly and messy. It's great. It's fun. It's like rice all over the face and (laughs) (laughs) definitely all over the table. But when I was growing up, I remember so distinctly my mom saying, God, you eat so quickly, just like your father, because they're separated. So I think that's like a common thing that happens when your children are separated parents. They compare you to the other one. And on my mom's side, when I was with her, she cooked, she was an amazing cook, but she cooked sort of like quite big, hearty British food in an agar, which is like a, do you know what an agar is? No. Sorry, I was just realized that this might not. So it's a, um, I guess it's a type of oven that is traditionally in farmhouses. So it's used to heat the house as well as be the oven. So it's got like two or three oven doors and like hobs on the top that are all heated from within and so you can't really control the temperature it's just always on I feel like we have some different word for that and I'm not I think it's like a hearth or something I'm not sure but there's some other other way of saying that I think in American and it's kind of like connected into the um, into the house and it's it acts as a sort of central heating for a home but it's kind of temperamental to cook with and you have to cook in different timings and you can't like choose the temperature and it's really 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 difficult to bake in <laughs> that's a tangent yeah it makes sense though <laughs> it's like basically always on a particular temperature you can never <laughs> exactly it's impossible and it is possible but they've come up with all these like new cookbooks like not new they're old but there's a whole different way of cooking anyway so she mastered it which was amazing and cooked these incredible meals that really brought our disjointed step family which had people living in other countries and coming back for holidays and you know I've got a family that's very interwoven in weird ways and so bringing them together around these amazing meals was was like this really important memory of my childhood and yeah when I'm thinking about it it's like really conflicted because I also have all these memories of my mum having a lot of shame around how much we ate and around my eating behavior specifically. So I'm an only child. I'm her only, I'm a her only child. And she would like give me love and love to feed me like that. But I think also she had, has a really complex relationship, um, fraught relationship with her body. 
And so uh, she kind of projected a lot of that onto me when I was eating a lot or when I was eating quickly or when I was being, you know, she perceived as greedy. She also would not eat a lot. So she would cook these amazing meals and then not sit down to eat. And maybe because she was busy, I felt like she was busy preparing still or like washing up or keeping herself busy. But I also felt like she would not eat. And this is something I've seen her since when I've left home. She doesn't eat a lot during the day, but then she would wake up in the night and eat loads of snacks. And she would always have snacks. So in the house. So I grew up in a house which was had loads of guests coming over, which was amazing. And we always used to feed them with crisps and chocolate. And there was always Cokes in the pantry. And there was a kind of like an abundance of food, but I did feel shame around wanting to eat it when I got to a certain age. So I have this kind of conflicting memory of food and how it was for me in my childhood. And I don't blame that on my mum at all because I think she was a you know, it's not really her fault that she felt a lot of the ways that she did around food. And I try not to blame either of my mom and my dad, even though we've both, we've had, I've had lots of conversations with them now, which when we go in back and like look at the way, the language that was used around food and diets and bodies, and it has obviously had an impact. No, but I think, yeah, the, their own cultural issues with food or backgrounds with food sounds like influenced them a lot. And certainly with your mom, it sounds like diet culture really came into play as well. Yeah. I'm not sure where my mom's, I don't know if she was a big into dieting. I don't think she was, but I think she's incredibly body conscious. And for her, that's been a huge factor in like her relationships and her self-esteem. And I don't think she ever wanted me to feel like that way. And I have a different body shape to her. So my dad is Jamaican Chinese and I have inherited his family shape. You know, I've got big breasts and big hips and like very voluptuous. And I think that I had a lot of insecurity about that when I was a young teenager because I developed really quickly. I was the first one to have a bra and like, you know, I was the first one to get my period. It was all just a lot and too soon for for my age, I felt. And all my friends were (laughs) very skinny naturally and that's just the way they were until they got to you know 18 19 20 whereas I developed and became really curvy and voluptuous when I was super young and so when she saw me in pain about that she wanted to fix it and the solution in her mind was like going on to Weight Watchers she wanted to help me but that was that was like how she felt like she could did she put you on Weight Watchers then or did she take you with her or she didn't put me on Weight Watchers. My sister moved back from Colorado where she was living. And she, my sister also was quite curvy and like voluptuous for a 16 year old. And she felt that she was quotation marks overweight at the time. So we both were like, I guess my mom must have suggested it. And we both went on it together, but we didn't go to the meetings. I probably think we were too young, but who knows? I think Weight Watchers advertised to all ages now. But at that time, we didn't go to meetings. It wasn't until later in my life that I started actually going to slimming meetings. I uh, had my mom's friend used to, who was on Weight Watchers used to come over, got us the books, and used to come over every week and weigh us and do the points and all that stuff. So Wow. You had like a DIY Weight Watchers meeting at home. <laughs> yeah, homegrown. Yes. And I was 13 or 14 then. So yeah, I, I learned early on like how to make myself way less at those kind of things, even though it was just for my mom's friend. And I remember so much. I used, I've always loved biscuits. Yeah, these are this is like something that we'll talk about now is like my my weird relationship. Not weird at all. It's just because I was on so many diets, I had this obsession with biscuits, and it developed at that first time going on Weight Watchers because I wouldn't allow myself any nice biscuits. But I would allow myself the rich. Do you have rich teas in the States? I don't think so. It might be a different brand here. I don't know. They're like really, really plain, bland, cream colored, flat, round things that you dunk in tea. Yes, yes. We have those. I forget what they're called here, but. Yeah, they're kind of cool. They're a bit sugary, but they were very plain. And I could have those because they were a certain amount of points or whatever. And I was never even that much of a dessert pudding kind of person, but not being able to have any snacks that I liked meant that I like put all of my investment into these really crappy, (laughs) plain biscuits and ate my weight's worth in them anyway. And then, yeah, that's, I was thinking about it yesterday about how I still now 
have problems buying whole packets of biscuits. Um, and I have to let myself, I have to allow myself to buy them in this like really conscious way. Cause I'm like, I don't want to hold myself back from this. I'm not going to eat everything like how I used to, but it's still a thought process in my head. And that's still like healing myself from this, the years of being in this diet cycle. I know that's so painful. I, I can very much identify with that too. And with the idea of eating something that is quote unquote approved or on plan by the diet at like eating it to the extreme because that's the only thing that's, you know, meeting the sweet need or the pleasure need that you're allowed quote unquote to have. And I've heard this from so many clients too, that the foods that they used to think they loved and they were like, I can't control myself around diet Mountain Dew or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> like once they're allowed to actually eat sweets, they're like, I don't even like that. That's really gross. Yeah. And I feel like when you, once you give yourself that unconditional permission for a while, it feels like I'm wanting it every day. But then you just realize, actually, you won't want it for months. You won't even think about it. You know, you won't even, it won't even cross your mind. And from going every day, every, every hour, of every day, thinking about one thing to like, it not really coming up in your brain at all is such a massive difference. Yeah. I mean, I, every time I talk about unconditional permission to eat, I'm reminded like, oh, I have all these foods in my pantry that I used to think I couldn't control myself around. Chips, cookies, candy, cereal, all things that I used to be like, oh, I can't have that in the house because if I do, I'm just going to polish off the whole bag or box right away. And now they're literally in my pantry all the time. And I never think about them unless I'm like, oh, what do I want for breakfast? What do I want for a snack? It's just not on my mind at all. Yeah, exactly. I think that's the freedom from thinking about food is is the biggest freedom of it all. I mean, when I was younger, going back to this teenage these teenagers of trying out different diets and meal plans, and even into my early twenties, I think that was the that was like the preoccupation that I really had to like unshackle myself from was that just constantly thinking about food and constantly being guilty about food, feeling shame around what I had eaten or about what I wanted to eat. And yeah, I mean, there's so much that I've found freedom from and freedom in, like since following more like intuitive eating or anti-diet approach. But that's definitely the biggest one, just the thought process. Oh, it's huge. It's draining. It is. It's so draining and it takes away your mental energy and your time for all the things that really matter. It's robbing you of that mental space. So I'm curious to go back to in adolescence when you started Weight Watchers and where did it go from there? You said you kind of went around to different meal plans and tried a bunch of different things. Yeah. So I think Weight Watchers and a bit of Atkins and I don't know. I don't really want to go into which specific ones because they're all absolute <laughs> garbage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just try not to say too much, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think also, which is really hard to to admit to myself, I was also dabbling and being, I don't know what the word is, but like not consistently, but having engaging in like bulimic behaviors that I haven't didn't admit or acknowledge for years or until recently and I still don't talk about it a lot because I think I just didn't want to admit that that had taken a hold of me that much that I was doing that to myself and at the time I thought it was like a physical thing but actually it was a lot about emotions and my mentality as well and then when I left home at 18 to go traveling I had this incredible experience traveling the world by myself for seven months, which was truly life changing, and I look back on it with so much happiness. But I also look back on it thinking that it was this another turning point in my relationship with my body because I put on loads of weight, and for some reason thought that that was like a terrible, terrible, life destroying, shameful thing. Even though I'd had the happiest seven months of my life, which just tends to be the pattern that I actually am very happy and. Um, might put on weight but then think that that's a bad thing even though it's not and because of that when I came back and I think I'd you know you're just you know I was in Thailand and Bali and Australia and I was drinking a lot I think that was the one of the big things and also just eating amazing food and having the time of my life when I came back I went on an incredible the strictest 
diet plan that I'd been on yet. And it was like one of the meal replacement ones. And I just, yeah, that really kicked off the next five years of yo-yo weight loss and weight gain and dieting. And when I should have been learning how to feed myself and learning how to nourish myself and learning how to cook more now that I wasn't in my house and I was going to uni. Instead, I was like completely taking away agency for myself and giving it to these sachets and powdered porridges and things that I can literally remember the taste of right now. And I, I so I, I missed a kind of valuable period of like learning how to cook and nourish myself. And having fun too, having, you know, pleasure and satisfaction in food. It sounds like you got so much of that when you were traveling and then like it scared you and you sort of backed completely away from it. Yeah, completely. I think like I see them, like when I look back on that memory, I see it in like (laughs) in this weird color. I see all these colors when I was traveling and I just see this like five month period of gray when I came back and I was at work and I was just following this plan and torturously hungry and yeah and then I went to uni and then obviously it's lots of like meeting people and again like drinking and going out and then it's like you know takeaways and all these things that perfectly fine but I think after the the extremity of that I've been eating before it just totally messed up my relationship with food and I went to a uni where I went to Oxford and they 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 want you to work the whole time so they don't want you to like really be cooking so they cater for you and you can you can cook in the evenings, but lunch and dinner is and breakfast is all provided. You pay for it, but as in it's like well, there's a canteen and you live where the canteen is. So again, it's like that kind of period, that formative period where I should have been experimenting and trying out what I like to cook and what I like to eat. I was relying on other people to give me food or again, following these, I could sort of oscillate between being on these strict plans and then off because I, I was never really good at that sustaining them. Well, no one is, right? I mean, it's just yeah, I mean, so natural to not be able to sustain them because your body's fighting back. Exactly. And it took me until recently to realize that that wasn't my fault. I mean, diet culture does a great job of making us feel like it's our fault, right? It makes mm-hmm. makes us feel like, oh, this plan is just great. And if you if you do it like the way we say, then you'll lose weight and everything will be great and move on with your life and just quote unquote maintain. But the problem is that it doesn't work like that. It's not actually designed to work like that. And I think diet companies know that too. It's not a secret that long-term weight loss really isn't possible except for a tiny fraction of the pers- of the population. I think they like know it because of the spikes. They they know that people return every year. They rely on people's return custom. They enjoy the spikes that you get in January and just before summer. And and that's how their business survives. But I think also they delude themselves into thinking, like most of the world, that, you know, because there are these few success stories, even if they don't last longer than two years or whatever, that, that somehow they still do work. Right. I think that it's such a collective collective belief that it's it works that weight loss is possible for most people for because it's possible for some it's possible for most people it's it's like those urban myths is like oh this person married this person because they met in this place and <laughs> that everyone believes that that's possible even though it's just it's the exception not the rule no that's so true you're right that i think a lot of diet companies and people in the you know especially like sort of individuals who are out there as proponents of a certain plan or whatever, think that it's real. Think that it if it works for me, it must work for everyone. Or if it worked for these few people, then it's possible. But the conclusion of like the only reason it's not is because of because it's your fault, because you lack quote unquote willpower. Like that part I think is such an insidious reading of that instead of, oh, it's quote unquote possible for people to be quote unquote successful. I'm saying quote unquote a million times now. <laughs> to be these unicorns who lose weight and keep it off long term. And it's not possible for, you know, 98% of everyone else, right? And so what's the difference there? Instead of saying, oh, the difference is that that tiny percentage of the population, their bodies and brains maybe lack the mechanisms that fight back against weight loss long term. And maybe these are people who are struggling with anorexia, the interpretation is, no, it's just that those people try harder and those people do it right, quote unquote, and like everyone else is not trying hard enough, which is just really a fundamental misreading, I think, of people's motivations. I mean, I know 
for myself and everyone I've seen who has been a chronic dieter, especially people in very large bodies, they try so goddamn hard. So hard. The struggle. So much struggle. And there's no lack of effort there. There's no laziness there. You know, there's, these are people who are incredibly conscientious and effortful and thoughtful and like on top of things in every aspect of their lives, including this. And they're literally at war with their bodies. So it's like such a huge uphill battle. It's remarkable that so many people put themselves through this and don't like, don't recognize how much of a fight they're in. And think that it's their fault. And also I think it's really reflective or it's a bit of an analogy for how we treat people generally like in a kind of capitalist framework or individualistic framework. We we think that everyone's capable of something and then we blame the people who don't do it. We blame the people that don't make it to don't fulfill our expectations. We assign the individual as this like person that just acts in like a almost like a vacuum. They can do whatever they want if they just try hard enough. That's that's the the rhetoric, right? It's the whole like American dream. It's the it's the why people who come from maybe like working class backgrounds and they make money, they then say, well, if I did it, then anyone can. And it's so poisonous because it just doesn't take into account all of the context, all of the other factors in someone's life. And yeah, diet culture is just such a reflection of of the wider society and how sort of fucked up it is. Totally. And how like people don't have an awareness of their own privilege. Cause I, I see that so often too, the people who come from a working class background and say, well, if I can make it, I've made it to this echelon of income or whatever. I've, I've made it to a place where I'm financially really comfortable. And if I can do that, anyone can not acknowledging all their privileges. And I feel like it's often a white cisgender heterosexual male who says those things, you know, able-bodied, oftentimes smaller bodied, et cetera, et cetera. That's so true. Like, even though they might have come from like an incredibly low income background, they still have all these other privileges they're not recognizing that get them one step up that ladder. Yeah, exactly. And like those privileges matter. That's, yeah, that's a large part of why they were able to quote unquote pull themselves up by their bootstraps. It wasn't really them, it was the bootstraps are like magic, you know, <laughs> because they're handed to them by society. Yeah. Also, what's with our like obsession with? comparing our past with everyone like being like well if we come from the same place or we have the same types of bodies or we grew up in the same way and I've made it to this point so therefore you should too it just I don't like this this narrative that we tell ourselves it's really annoying (laughs) yeah it's it's totally frustrating because it is that comparison thing and not acknowledging that everybody is different and everybody's backgrounds are different and people have different privileges and oppressions that they face that might change the course of their lives Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> it's, I mean, there's so much there, but I'm, I want to get back to your story and sort of how things unfolded for you in, in college and beyond. It sounds like you were really kind of back and forth between like restrictive dieting and free for all, allowing yourself to eat what you wanted at the canteen, but then feeling bad about it and ashamed. Yeah. I mean, I had, I was like a very confident, outgoing person. I kind of always have been. And so a lot of this yo-yoing and back and forth and struggle was really internal. And although it manifested obviously in like physical things, like, you know, me being obviously on diets or like following meal plans or, you know, trying to follow some strict exercise regime or not going to certain places because I was trying to stay away from temptation, quote unquote, that was a, that was a quote unquote. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I also was doing a lot of it internally and because I was outwardly quite confident and sexual, I was inside, I was like, but I don't deserve to be and I only I could do better and nothing I achieve or nothing, no friendships or relationships or academic things that I do are good enough because at the end of the day, I still haven't lost this weight. I still haven't kept off this weight. I've lost it many times, but I've always put it back on. And comparing myself again to other people who managed to just, in my head, they just managed to shed this weight and keep it off. And why couldn't I? And it would just drain me. Um, But I was also always in touch with my body in a way that I think other people, other people who don't have like a disability or a condition that they grow up with, 
they don't have. But so I have a I have fibrous dysplasia in my leg, which is like a very rare bone condition. That meant I had pretty major operation in my femur when I was six, and then again when I was eleven. So I, you know, I have a limp when I walk, um, which is, you know, quite small but very pronounced when I'm tired or in pain. I have lots of pain every day, and I can't move my hip in certain ways. I can't run or jump or do high impact stuff, but I can do most things. I'm not, I only need to use crutches like when it's super bad or really cold, (laughs) like now. And I generally, it didn't stop me from doing a lot of things, but it made me definitely have a complex relationship with exercise because I wanted to take part in it. I liked moving my body. I used to love to dance I used to dance every day and go to the dance classes every week until I got too into like sex and boys and things. And then I stopped doing all my extracurricular things. But I used to really enjoy moving in that way. And then when it got to uni, I loved, well, I thought I loved and got really into like going to the gym and stuff and doing all those YouTube. But that was you know, 20 and 30 now. So it was sort of when YouTube exercise videos were blowing up yeah I was like obsessively following those but I would always do myself real damage so I had to learn quite quickly in my early 20s how to care for my body and not push myself to these massive extremes I think it, until I was sort of 24 I kept doing this thing where I was like trying to lose weight and so I would go to the gym loads in a week um, or for a period of time and then damage like injure myself essentially from doing things that I wasn't strong enough to do in my leg but I felt like I needed to follow what this person was doing in the YouTube video to be that's how what exercise looked like and ending up walking around in crutches and not being able to work out for a while and then not moving my body at all because I was so thinking movements only for losing weight essentially Mm -hmm. and any attempt at it is just like pointless and that took a lot of harsh realizations yeah of lots of pain to realize that I needed to fix how I saw exercise and movement but yeah I think having a scar having the limp always made me more conscious of my body growing up being developed quickly etc and I was just trying to fit in like you like everyone is I was just trying to be like all the bodies around me. I didn't have a lot of fat role models or curvy role models back then. And, you know, I grew up in the 90s and my mum was really slim. And yeah, it was just, I was just, I was just trying to blend in, assimilate. <laughs> oh, of course. I mean, that's so painful, like literally painful to think about how you pushed yourself to exercise in a way that was not good for your body and not compatible with your abilities. and yet you thought that this was the only way. Because I think that is what diet culture pushes on us. It's like, you have to do this this way in order to be losing weight, in order to be quote unquote healthy, in order to be good at whatever the activity is, rather than giving modifications and sort of taking into account people's different abilities within the context of the class. You know, I, I think it's one another way in which ableism is just built into our society yeah no pain no gain right mm-hmm. that's actually a thing that that is <laughs> exactly what we used to tell ourselves and like obviously an element of movement if you're doing certain types of movement will come with aches but to like push through pain is really not li- listening to your body I was quite good at requiring instructors to change modify things for me because I've always had this disability so I ha- I wasn't able to do certain movements in exercise classes and I wasn't, I couldn't even stand on one leg for a lot of time and sometimes I still can't. So there are certain things that I knew I couldn't do and I was, I grew a kind of confidence in being able to express that, but still part of me wanted to fit in and still I would push through certain things and I would still on my own as well, try and move my bodies in ways, try and fit my bodies into this, like doing squats. But I love weightlifting. I actually really love using weights in the gym and stuff, but I was had just got into it and I was really trying to push myself and be like all the other bros and gym bunnies. And, um, yeah, it really, it really messed with my hip. Obviously if you're doing squat and your hips are in balance, you've got one leg short to the other. You're going to, you're going to mess yourself up if you're going down. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't good. <laughs> was that part of like the pain that you were experiencing from that? Did that ever sort of alert you to the fact that 
maybe you shouldn't be exercising in this way that was maybe too intense or extreme for you? Yeah. So twice I went to the hospital, my doctor said that I shouldn't, it was hard because often you'd go to the doctors and I think a lot of people with like bone conditions or disabilities might relate to this and and potentially people with bigger bodies as well. You go to the doctors and you're told, you're asked about, you're kind of quizzed about like your movement and your exercise and what you're doing. And, and so you feel a kind of pressure to be doing stuff. And I definitely did because I, I feel I, I need to keep my legs strong. So part of my operations, they did cut through a lot of the muscle and after surgery, restoring that muscle is really important, especially when it's like in your glutes and your leg. So I was doing physio from the age of six really and regularly, but I wasn't very, I wasn't good at keeping it up daily and so I felt a lot of pressure when I went to the hospital to be doing more small movement but then I went back twice and they were like well I feel like you're actually doing the wrong types of movement you're probably be doing too much you need to not go back you need to not exercise apart from swimming while you let your leg rest um take your weight off use crutches blah 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 and then by the time that's over you just then it's really hard to get back into movement and seeing it as anything but losing weight so yeah it definitely it definitely did shook me a bit, shook me a little bit. But I didn't, I didn't put it together with my dieting, with diet culture until much later on. I didn't realize that I was hurting myself because I wanted to lose weight until a couple of years ago. Yeah. So how did you start to come out of that? How did you start to wake up to the fact that dieting was hurting you and that eventually movement was hurting you too? I think the kind of turning point was around three three and a half years ago when I was traveling with my now ex-boyfriend and we were in Mexico we just sort of started the beginning of a trip and I found a I got sent or I got tagged in a picture of myself a year before when I was had been in India for for like six weeks and I had lost loads of weight and I was really what I saw as like skinny and I hadn't realized at the time it was kind of because I probably just had dysentery. <laughs> I was probably just really unwell in India, but like it was, it was not intentional at all. It's just one of those things that happens. And um, when, when you can't like keep anything in. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just like pooping your brains out. <laughs> yeah, basically. For like the last two weeks, that's what was happening. And um, so I saw this job the last week in, of when I was in India and a week late and a year later, I'm in Mexico having, you know, been in, in a loving relationship for a year and was really happy. But I saw this photo and it just totally triggered this mad spiral of self-pity and self-flagellation and really hating on myself. I was like, for failing once again, that's how I saw it. I was like, oh my God, Becky, you lost all that weight and you, again, you fucked it up. Like, how could you? Like, you're the only person in the world that could, like, lose that much weight and be at that amazing set at that time when I, you know, you never think you're at your weight, the ideal weight. You just never do. But um, looking back, I thought I was at this amazing weight and that I um, totally disappointed myself. And so I started planning all these new diet things. Even though I was in Mexico, I was like, I was really upset, crying. And it just was, it was like, fuck. I think I was scared, actually. I think I was oh my God, I'm going to have to do this all over again while I'm traveling. It's going to be really hard to do this because I'm, you know, I'm in Mexico and I'm around with this incredible food and um, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm going to fail and all this fear and self-doubt. And I went looking for on Instagram and like on blogs and things. And I just discovered this whole community of fat women living unapologetically saying no to weight loss saying that they were just happy how they were wearing colorful revealing clothes and it just was a light bulb moment in my head I'd I'd read fat was a feminist issue and when I was at uni because I did a ironically I did a whole thesis on feminist movements and how they presented themselves about like body hair and fat and like clothing and and I said I read a fat is a feminist issue but I never thought that I could uh, like apply that that theory that politics to my own life so 10 years later, or less than that, seven years later, I see all these, I find a community of people who are really embracing that politics in like a personal sense. And it just, something switched in my head. And I just thought, that's how I want to be. I want to live my life like that person. I want to 
they look free and they look like they don't give a shit and they they look really unburdened because of it and I feel like that's actually how I should be living actually I'm actually a very free and happy and outgoing and energetic person why I think I'm actually dimming my light by trying to shrink myself and maybe I've got more to give or maybe it doesn't matter maybe it's not as important and then that was just the start of like find researching and reading more into it and finding out about the biology and the science behind why diets fail and why my men like my preoccupation with food and my mental health had suffered because of it and you know you're just constantly finding out new things that just reaffirm a feeling that I had um you know finding your podcast was at the very beginning of this journey because I was looking for you know I think you're looking for evidence and people to sort of support in a kind of <laughs> you really want like science you want sciencey people to say things to you <laughs> 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 to tell you that it's okay <laughs> you really really like look up like the people with the qualifications mm -hmm. and so I sort, sort of was seeking that out at the beginning and yeah it was just this whole journey and it still is I'm still learning so much every day about my own relationship to food but also like as a society how how messed up how messed up it is yeah I mean that sociological piece is huge too that was a similar trajectory for me actually it was learning about first of all kind of personally deciding to stop dieting and like learning intuitive eating for myself, but then learning the facts about health at every size and intuitive eating, learning the science, and then learning about the sociology, like learning about where this comes from. I feel like it was just pulling this thread of like, okay, but why? Okay, but why? Like what, why are we here? How did we get here? Why do we have all this information about weight loss that's so biased and not true coming out of the mainstream thinking and, and scientific research and just pulling that thread was just and continues to be so fascinating and fulfilling to me that like there's just more and more to know about it and infuriating too because when you really get into it and as to like why why we're here you realize that it's because of racism and patriarchy and ableism and all of the stuff like all of the oppressive bullshit basically yeah but the anger is super useful. So mm -hmm. I think that without without being angry at, at like these oppressive structures, I wouldn't be able to remember why it's personally important for me to rebel against them for my own personal like, you know, development and for everyone else. And I think that's a big part of when I talk to other people about how to maybe change their relationship with their bodies. For me, it does start with the like getting angry at society for making you feel this way and knowing that it's not your fault and that it, it's like very common for people to feel like this. So like finding a community on Instagram, like finding people who were talking about these things that were going on in my head and then realizing that this was part of a wider, not conspiracy, but, you know, structural phenomenon and then being angry at that, that was came before me like finding out about like what intuitive eating was and and like how to incorporate that into my life because I think for me it was more about like healing the body image stuff, the shame, that kind of freeing myself from feeling so bad about my body. And that is the underlying thing for so many people, I think, because we wouldn't eat in a way that's disordered and we would never go on a diet if it weren't for the body shame in the first place, right? It's the driving force. Exactly. And that anger piece is so useful. I really am glad you brought that up because I mean, I think too that that's a, an ingredient in healing that is essential. I think you can't really fully heal from diet culture and these oppressive forces that act on us if you don't get angry at them because anger anger is a way of distancing yourself from those forces and saying like, I see you acting on me and I reject it. Yeah, totally. I was reading something recently about like outrage and the kind of phenomenon of outrage on social media and things. And I think it's different to feeling angry against the structure because you can, you can feel anger that doesn't like weigh you down. You know, you can feel an anger at racism and at sexism and ableism and, you know, colonialism that is saddening and infuriating and yeah it feels really it's a lot it's a lot of emotion hopefully you're angry because you understand how it works and by understanding how it works you can really be like okay 
I'm angry and yes, it's fearing, but it doesn't have to have this huge impact on me. It doesn't have to like drain me down like some anger does. You know, you don't like hold on to anger for someone else because it's going to hurt yourself. But I think it can be really productive in the sense to to understand something and there to be angry and then and to also keep to keep relearning how it works. Um, you can't just have a fixed idea of like how diet culture operates and then be angry at that and only that. You kind of have to still be a bit flexible. Right. And I think it, it also is going to morph and shape shift over time. The ways in which it shows up are going to be different. So yeah, you have to kind of be flexible in terms of understanding what it looks like out in the world and seeing the new manifestations of it, just like with patriarchy and white supremacy and all the rest, right? Because it's it also kind of those things shape shift and morph over time too. And I think like my relationship with anger against all of these things changes as I age and I feel more compassion towards like the people who are, who have maybe propagated it in my life, but who are also victims of those structures whereas I would get use that anger and use it against them maybe in arguments or debates or you know against your parents or whoever and I do feel like there's as I I'm definitely way less angry about certain things than I was when I was like 18 to 21 you know when I was really immersed in those of feminist theory and god if it came up at the dinner table I was gonna lose my shit <laughs> whereas now I'm much more I don't let it go it's not like I would not call things out if I was able to but I certainly have a lot more compassion and understanding and empathy for the fact that like we're, we're all such victims of it and um, more so some more than others, but yeah, complex. <laughs> it is, it is totally. And I think sometimes that anger at first towards the people who perpetuated diet culture in your immediate family or people who brought it into your life is so understandable. And I think that's a probably a pretty normal phase for most people, but then I think, yeah, getting past that towards compassion and like anger at the larger system and how it, those people are victims to it too, like you said, I think helps you reframe and redirect the anger to where it really needs to go. But that's not to say that if someone has like a, an abusive person in their life who is constantly shaming them about their weight or their body, that that's okay. Cause it's not, uh, yeah. that needs to change too. That's where like setting boundaries comes into play. But in terms of like the people who are well-meaning in your life, who just happen to perpetuate diet culture on you and aren't actively abusing you anymore. I think mm -hmm. that's where that, that compassion really is important. Yeah. And those, those conversations are always going to be difficult. <sighs> Like it's still such a minefield navigating diet chat. Even now, you know, I, I run an organization called Anti-Diet Riot Club, but I still find myself in a lot of really weird conversations with people that obviously don't don't read the first two words of, of my of <laughs> right. business. But yeah, it's still difficult. And I, I people ask all the time, like, how do I respond to this? And how do I what do I say to my colleague or my family? And and I, I still struggle with the right response or you know not snapping or giving information in a, in a in a way that invites them to be curious about it it's hard it is really hard yeah what have you found useful with that what do you, what are some of your strategies for responding to people in those ways i <laughs> what i would say to other people is to check in with yourself and feel try and see how you feel like how much energy you have to approach the subject because it can be really useful to say to someone, did you know that most diet, like the majority of diets don't work and that they fail and you end up putting the weight back on or more and they, you know, they lead to this preoccupation with food in this kind of like, did you know way, if you're able to reel off that information, because they might not know. And if you have the energy, then you can start a conversation. But often this is not the first time that's happened around you and you feel like, drained and I often do and so I often have to be like I don't want to speak about diets because of my relationship with you know extreme dieting and disordered eating and you know how you know about my relationship with that if they are a close friend and so I'd rather not speak about it then it's like to the sassy of like this is the most boring conversation do we not have something more interesting to talk about <laughs> I'm more than my body I'm more than my weight loss it's like is that all you value in me but I think 
it really depends on and how you feel the energy that you have because sometimes you can just ignore it and go about your day in a much happier way than if you're engaging with these people because it's not necessarily your responsibility to educate them Mm -hmm. yeah so from ignoring to sassy remarks to quite measured I don't want to talk about this to curious curiosity engaging conversation I love it. I think that's, it's so important to have a repertoire of options too. Cause yeah. like you said, there's going to be moments when you just don't feel like you want to deal with it. You don't feel like engaging. Yeah. And I think if you can remove yourself from the room or the conversation, then that's your, that's your fucking earth given right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are not frozen in place. We, we no, have the and ability to move around. Exactly. If someone is being fat shaming, I would encourage practicing calling that out because it's become such a common, almost like non-shocking thing for people to be so fat phobic in casual conversation, but it's not okay. And you definitely don't have to put up with it. Like you wouldn't put up with, um, hopefully, you know, someone saying racist or sexist or homophobic comments. And so I would definitely invite people to, to start calling that out in public if they can. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, to whatever extent is available to you in that moment. But I think, and especially too, I think thin allies to this movement have a really important role to play there too, because... Even more so, yeah. mm -hmm. I've heard from a lot of fat activists that it's exhausting for them to always be the one and the only one in most situations to be bringing this stuff up. And that if thin allies could also be talking about this, that it would move the needle maybe a lot more in situations where people aren't going to listen to the fat person and also just take off some of the burden from fat people always having to be the ones to educate. Yeah. Or or being the ones that want to, but don't say anything in a social situation. Um, And they feel that they don't say anything. You know, I I would want to stick up for them or not for them, but to protect them (laughs) because they don't have to, they don't have to put up with that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And and they deserve protection. They deserve help and support with that, just like, you know, everyone else. Exactly. Well, so I'm curious to hear about Anti-Diet Riot Club and how that started, how you got the idea for it and how it's evolved. So from the time when I kind of discovered this whole Instagram blogging community when I was in Mexico, I was away for months. And while I was out there, I was trying to do a lot of healing, a lot of reading and a lot of healing with my own body image. Um, and I started talking about it to my friends to like, I started talking about it on my Instagram. So just like, I was obviously you're posting a lot of photos of you on holiday and, and it's in your bikini. And I kind of started being like talking about my, the internal stuff that was going on with like posting this and, you know, how I was trying to embrace my body, like who cares about roles and, you know, who cares that. I have this massive scar or cellulite and trying to experiment with like this way of talking about my body and talking about it publicly. And I started getting all these messages from friends, old friends, close friends, or people that I knew just being like, wow, you know, I didn't realize that you felt this way. And obviously I knew that you were dieting a lot, but like, it's really brave to talk about it and, you know, really, really impressed. And I feel that way too. And I felt, I thought it was cool because a lot of this goes unsaid even amongst your closest and oldest friends you know you just it's either considered completely normal to hate yourself and to talk about yourself like absolute crap and to put yourself through this these torturous regimes or it's just not spoken about at all and we're all just like living these kind of atomized lives that share so much in common but we're never speaking about it and I really got a lot from that and I was like talking speaking to more people in the community in the online community that I didn't know but that becoming sort of friends and when I got back I just felt when I was jobless at first and I was really looking for something that aligned with my values my sort of sole purpose and I was working then I started working but I wasn't being fulfilled so my usual work is in events and marketing and yeah I love it and it's fun but it just doesn't I wasn't working on events that I believed in or content that I really like fulfilled me and then I thought I want to bring this amazing community that I found online and I'd love to meet them I'd love to create my own little community in person like I my none of my friends were into body acceptance movements or politics or I couldn't talk to my close close friends or family about it 
And I was talking to people online and I just thought, wow, I'm sure there's more people in London that want to talk about this. So I love to put on events. So I'm going to do one. I'm going to put on an event um, and I'm going to invite people and hopefully people will come and I'll invite, I'll give, I'll invite speakers to, you know, educate me and the people that are coming. Cause I, I was at that then I wasn't the speaker. I was just trying to create a space for people to talk about it. And I think it was in my head, I thought it will be like a, it will be like a slimming club, but but it won't be anything to do with slimming. It'll be the opposite. And we'll talk about, we'll share and we'll connect, but we won't weigh each other or measure or, oh God, have any of that shameful confessions that you used to do around in a circle. It'll be the opposite of that. Anyway, so I love that. That's kind of how this, this, the seeds were planted in my head. And it took months and months to actually be brave enough to do anything about it. But I eventually came up with the name Antidote Riot Club, which I thought was really cool. And it kind of was rebellious and reminded me of like, you know, the protests that I used to be on when I was younger, but in like a sort of small personal protest way. <laughs> and yeah, and then I decided I'm going to do it. And in January of 2018, just announced to, to my friends, I'm, I'm going to do this thing. And, you know, I, this is how I feel. And January is bullshit and everyone should come. Anyway, that was it was tiny. I put Megan Crabb to speak, who is from Essex, so nearby London, and she, um, yeah, she was our first speaker. And I sent out like the press picked up on it, and it we got it was sold out. So a hundred people came. Wow. Yeah, it's so the first one, and that that was kind of where it grew from. That's huge. That's so amazing that the first one you sold out, and it speaks to. I think the desire for this kind of stuff, the the hunger for this anti diet content. Yeah, definitely. It was felt, it felt like everyone was like, we need this, you know, like, and it word spread really quickly. Loads of people were sending it to their friends and people were messaging me saying, wow, just my friends just sent me this. This is amazing. I'm going to bring me and my friends and people that I went to school with when I was eight came. Wow. They'd heard and they were sat at the back. And at the beginning, I introduced myself and talked a bit about my journey and they came up to me in the end. It's like, God, it's so funny talking about this stuff now because I remember, you know, your, you know, my insecurities and you, us being all on diets and us exchanging all this information. Like, it is so toxic. And some people have even apologized who I went like boys who I was friends with when I was 13, 14, who used to like call Nick, call me names and stuff. They sent me back and apologized. And, and, and most of my, most of the people realize now how damaging and toxic. And again, that kind of culture was, but again, it wasn't their fault. They were just young boys. Right. And they were a part of diet culture, just like everyone else and yeah. absorbing those messages from the culture. Yeah. And I mean, if, if Chandler from Friends can constantly ridicule fat people, then, you know, why shouldn't they like... Right, exactly. <laughs> they're just young kids absorbing all of that stuff. Yeah, it's the cultural messages that give people the idea to do that. It's not it's not their own inception. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's amazing and sounds so healing too to have people literally from childhood who were part of the inception of your own body shame to, to apologize and to recognize the error of their ways. It's got to feel so just healing. Yeah, it's amazing, actually. I've, I haven't really thought about it like that until right now. And I think that's, I feel very lucky to have brought this, like integrated that into my life in this way. But I really hope that that's something that other people can do. I hopefully like one day people can start their own anti-diet riot clubs and start their own local communities because the online community is so powerful and is my route into the whole movement um, and to bringing that politics into my personal life. But the existence of this like in real life space that I've created is definitely what's nourished me the most because I think I don't want to spend as much time online as I already do. And I don't want to feel atomized anymore. And I don't think that it's social media is like to blame for that. But I, I love the fact that we can like meet in person and connect in real life. It's it's really powerful. Yeah, it's huge. And it is it is something that is so missing, I think, from this community online. You know, I think it just speaks to the fact that 
a lot of people don't live in communities where the anti-diet message exists. And so, you know, the only place they can find for it is online. But I'm excited to hear about your bus and the fact that you're sort of taking anti-diet riot club on the road, because that also would seem to, you know, I think it's one thing to do it in London, which is awesome and, and so needed. And London's probably a place that has more resources for anti-diet stuff available versus like rural places, right? Without a doubt. I mean, it has Laura Thomas's intuitive eating clinic. It has more and more increasingly there are plays or cabarets or sort of spaces that, you know, London's got so much going on. And so we constantly get messages asked from people all over the UK and all over the world, like, can you come here? Can you do an event here? And we would love to. That would be amazing if we could just fly or drive or get to these places. But it costs a lot and there's like venue costs and then it's like promoting it. And in my head, I just kind of like, how can I, how can I take this to other people in a way that's not going to stress me out? Mm -hmm. Where you have to charge like $500 per event because it's so expensive. Yeah, exactly. Because it's so expensive to run. And then we started taking, I met Harry Rose, who is the kind of co-creator of Anti-Right Club now. So she, we, we started doing we met up became friends we started doing workshops at festivals together and we were kind of separate people then separate enterprises and then it went went really well we really loved taking the kind of weird workshops we do all about like engaging with our bodies or being creative to people outside of London and to these like really amazing spaces and then off the back of that I just thought well you know we could do a bus we could take a bus to festivals and then I thought, actually, we should take the bus all around the UK. The great thing about bus, it's like it's a roaming event space. It's we can take out all the seats. We can do workshops on the bus. We can do talks from the bus and it can be like a hub of information. We can have a body positive library and book clubs and we can do plus size clothing swaps. And yeah, so we came up, I came up with the idea and then we started a crowdfunded campaign. So this six week campaign to raise a hell of a lot of money, 15,000 pounds, to um, build this ridiculous bus idea that I had. And uh, we did it. Um, And so now we are building it. So we completed the campaign in July, but we never wanted to start the tour until 2020. So it's going to start on International Women's Day in March the 8th next year. And we've got the bus now. We were just buying the bus this big old white Mercedes sort of passenger bus. And we are getting converted professionally into the anti-diet riot bus. And it's going to start in a city called Sheffield and Leeds in the UK and then travel hopefully up to kind of the four corners. So we do plan to go to Wales and Glasgow, Edinburgh, Newcastle in the north and all the way down south to the coast as well, popping up, like popping off, stopping off at um, a few events festivals or gatherings where we can along the way. I love that so much. It's so cool that you had that idea. It's just very creative and unique. And I don't think I know anyone else who has a bus in this in this <laughs> space. It's like it definitely I don't think it's people's usual response to like, how do we get this message out there? I'm gonna build up I'm gonna have a bus. Right. But I think anti right spirit is fun, I think at its core. Although it talks about really serious topics and it's about community and sharing and that support for each other, it's also a bit riotous and sort of irreverent and fun. I just want it to be fun. You know, I want people to feel like inspired. Like I want people to feel how I felt when I saw that with those people on Instagram living their best lives and living like colourfully and like, yes, that's that's what I want I want to be part of that that train but it's a bus <laughs> I want to jump on that bus maybe one day a train also so we've got as well as we do these workshops about we do life body positive life drawing which is a really popular one we also do boob printing which is all about celebrating all the different types of boobs mm-hmm. and we do sort of self-love gratitude journaling a thing called fuck size modeling which is like empowering inclusive photo shoots and yeah just the as well as like the plus size clothing swaps, which I think is something I'm really excited about running all around the UK because they don't happen everywhere. And I think they're really important. And hopefully it can be, um, yeah, a help to people around the UK who don't really get access to this stuff. 
Absolutely. I think it's amazing and, and so needed. So tell us where people can find you and learn more about your work and your upcoming events. So you probably would want to head to our Instagram because the website's currently being refurbished. But um, it is www.antidietrightclub.co.uk. So check it out. Otherwise, at Anti Diet Riot Club. We are also doing our first festival in January, Anti Diet Riot Fest. So that's all day of workshops and talks from experts and campaigners and um, basically all the kind of like pro pleasure, fat positive, body positive, self, radical self love content that we talk about online or like in our single events, but all under one roof, which I think is quite rare. So yeah, we that's online now. Tickets are on sale. Otherwise, do connect with us if you have want want to bring the bus to like your local town or your college, or your university, or institutional workplace. We really want to connect with people all across the UK, and maybe even Europe. We just need the people who live in those areas to get in touch and let us know and help us get there, really. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I'm so excited to share this message with everyone, and we'll put links to all that in the show notes so people can find you and get in touch and have you come see them. (laughs) I love it. Yeah. And hopefully you'll make it over to the US at some point too. I would love that. I would absolutely love that. And you know what? I think you coming to the UK with your book, when you do, get in touch because uh, people would just absolutely love to come and see you, have a reading, all that kind of thing. And, And that's what we like setting up. We just like creating these spaces where people can come together and rebel in in our own small way. (laughs) I love it. I definitely will keep you posted. I for sure want to come to the UK. So yes, anti-diet and anti-diet riot club (laughs) collab. It'll be amazing. (laughs) Yes, definitely. Well, thank you so much, Becky. It's so great talking with you. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor. I'm really pleased and stoked to be involved. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to Becky Young for joining me on this episode. And thanks to you for listening. If you've gotten something out of this podcast, please help us reach more people who need to hear the anti-diet message because who doesn't this time of year, especially by sharing this episode and subscribing to the pod on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. You can see all the places to subscribe at christyharrison.com slash subscribe. That's christyharrison.com slash subscribe. If you're looking for some practical tips to help you get started on the anti-diet path, grab my free audio guide, Seven Simple Strategies for Finding Peace and Freedom with Food. Just go to christyharrison.com slash strategies to get it. That's christyharrison.com slash strategies. To get full show notes from this episode, including all the resources we discussed, plus a full transcript, head over to christyharrison.com slash 221. That's christyharrison.com slash 221. And to get the transcript, just scroll down to the bottom of the page and enter your email address. This episode was brought to you by Thread Up. Shopping for sustainable, affordable, and adorable new clothes in the new year is a whole lot easier with Thread Up. Get an exclusive offer of an extra 30% off your first order when you go to threadup.com slash foodpsych. That's T-H-R-E-D-U-P dot com slash F-O-O-D-P-S-Y-C-H for 30% off your first order today. Terms apply. A big thanks, as always, to our editor and sound engineer, Mike Lalonde, our community and content associate, Vinci Chue, and our administrative assistant, Julianne Watasek, for helping me out with all the moving parts that go into producing this show every week. Our album art was photographed by Abby Moore Photography and designed by Meredith Noble. And our theme song was written and performed by Carolyn Pennypacker Riggs. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, stay psyched. Ooh, so-